missed my great final chord there. <clears throat> you know, speaking of the, the kids getting up and leaving, this is not part of my talk here, but I just thought of this. A number of years ago, I was, in, I was in the middle of doing a talk, and all of a sudden, about 10 people right back here, not in this room, but a different place, jumped up and ran out. Just all of a sudden, like 10 people just jumped up. And I was like, what did I just I must have said something real offensive there, you know? I found out after the service, there was this kid, like 14 years old, who has projectile vomiting. <laughs> and all of a sudden, with no advance warning, he just barfed over a, and, and hit a bunch of people. And that's why they all jumped up. It's like, okay, I feel better about that explanation than the one I thought had happened. Anyway, have you ever sat in a school classroom and heard things like, the subject is the direct object of the present participle in the nominative case? Or force equals mass times acceleration? Or the square root of t divided by x equals y over z? Or something like that. And I'm never hearing those things. I had no idea what any of them meant. And I thought, what? why do we need to learn stuff like that? And the teacher's response would always be, it's going to be on the test. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what, what does that have to do with real life, though? Unless I'm going to become a molecular biologist, what am I going to do with this information? You know, what's the point of expending energy on trying to learn these things? I thought, why not have a class on, like, CPR? That would really be useful or how to balance a checkbook, or how to change the oil in your car, something we could use in our real life. Well, I think some people have a similar thoughts about the resurrection of Christ. You know, well, even if Jesus did rise from the dead, that was like 2,000 years ago. What bearing would that have on my life today? Well, let's say today we were to bring in a panel of experts who had thoroughly studied all the evidences regarding whether or not Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead, I believe the vast majority of us would, upon closely considering those facts, would probably agree that the preponderance of the evidence clearly falls on the side of the resurrection being an actual historical event. I think most of us could be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. So today I'm not talking about the evidences for the resurrection. I want to talk about how that event can and should impact your life. And you might be thinking, how would that be? Things that happened 10 years ago, 50 years ago, are not relevant to my life. How could something that happened 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world, how is that going to affect my life today? How is that going to improve my situation at work? How is that going to affect my financial picture or make my relationships better? Today, I want you to consider three ways that Jesus' death and resurrection can and should impact your life. And first, it can impact your past. Now, several years ago, I received kind of a strange phone call. A guy said, I don't know if you remember me, but my name is, is such and such, and I used to come to your youth meetings a long time ago. And I said, yeah, I remember. And he said, well, there's something that happened 18 years ago that I've got to talk with you about. And I thought, oh, man, what did I do 18 years ago that only this guy knows immediate paranoia there. But anyway, I said very hesitantly, what, what is it exactly that you want to talk about? He said, remember back when the church was in the Boomer Theater and that set of drums was stolen? He said, well, I was the one that stole them. And I said, I recall when those drums were stolen. And he said, man, and not a day has gone by in these past 18 years that I haven't felt bad about what I did. And I kind of jumped in and I said, hey, it's OK. We got a new set of drums. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. God will forgive you. We'll forgive you. No problem. But he said, no, I won't feel right unless I pay the church back. And even though I insisted that wasn't necessary, that afternoon he actually dropped a check by the church office for $600. Now, some of you here may be able to relate to that guy because at some time in the past you've done something really bad something you felt terrible about and still feel terrible about maybe many, many years later. Maybe a lot worse than stealing drums from a church. And the guilt has eaten away at you, just like it did at this guy. And you know, God can forgive things that we've done in our past. Now, some of you might be thinking, I never did anything like that. I mean, I wasn't perfect, but I knew the difference between right and wrong. I, you know, I never, I've been a pretty good person. 
Well, just to test that, I want to give all of us here a little self-inventory, okay? I'm going to mention some common sins, and let's see whether or not you've committed these to see if you, you know, if really are not that bad of a person. For instance, how many of you, the sin of lying, how many of you have ever in your life, at least one time in your life, have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Yeah, uh, we got a whole bunch of liars right here on Easter Sunday morning. That's terrible. Next, what? Has there ever been a time when you took something that wasn't yours? Maybe you were a little kid, maybe not, but you took something, you stole something. You took something that wasn't yours. If you've ever done that in your life, raise your hands. If you've ever taken something, a few of you are not holding your hands out, and you are, you are liars. But, so we have liars, and we have a lot of thieves here. The Bible says that to, to, it's a sin to gossip, you know, say bad things about other people. The Bible calls it slander. And that, that's wrong. That's a sin. How many of you have ever, ever said something bad about another person in, in your life? Yeah. Okay, one more. How about the sin of lust? Would you be willing to own up to committing that one at least once in your life? You don't have to raise your hand up all the way. Maybe just <laughs> a little bit. So apparently we have a crowd of liars, thieves, gossips, and perverts right here on <laughs> Easter Sunday morning. And that is not an exhaustive list. I just thought, I, you know, those are just a few. The point is we're all sinners. We've all done things that are wrong in God's sight, meaning that we're all in need of God's forgiveness. Now, I'm sure a lot of you recognize what this is. It's a little contraption called an Etch-A-Sketch. And you remember how it works. You turn those little dials, and you try to draw a little picture. You can write out words. And when you mess up, remember what you do? You turn it over. You shake it a little bit. You flip it back up, and voila. You have a clean slate again, a fresh start. Well, here's what might be called the Etch-A-Sketch verse of the Bible. It's 1 John 1, 9, and the one, it's the one that says, If we'll, we will acknowledge or own up before God the things we've done, he'll forgive us. And he wipes the slate clean. And that's what the death of Jesus on the cross is all about. It's the innocent, the one who had never sinned, taking the punishment for the guilty. That would be you and me. At a funeral, the speaker told of a conversation that he had once had with the deceased man. He asked him why for 40 years he had gotten up at 4 in the morning every day to go off to his low-paying job. The man's answer was, so that my three sons wouldn't have to. He said, I wanted to provide them with an education and the opportunities that I didn't have, and I did it so they wouldn't have to. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. So you and I wouldn't have to. So rather than you receiving the penalty and the consequences of your sins, he would step in and receive that, even though he didn't deserve it, in your place. One time I was talking with a friend of mine who was kind of new to the whole church deal, and he said, hey, I heard such and such a person is being crucified on May 7th. And I was like, what? I said, oh, you mean he's getting baptized on May 7th. He said, crucified, baptized, whatever. <laughs> there is actually a difference. Jesus was crucified, so we wouldn't have to. We've all sinned, we know it, some worse than others, but we can all find forgiveness for all those past sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. A second way that Jesus' death and resurrection can impact your life not only has to do with your past, the sins that you've committed, but also with your present, right now. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus himself said, I want you to have life, to live life at its very fullest. But you know, the common perception is, if I were to get serious about this God stuff, really aspire to live my life the way the Bible says, you know, my life would be over. It would be terrible. I wouldn't get to have fun anymore. I wouldn't get to do all the things that I like to do. When in reality, I think the vast majority of pe people who do cross over the line of faith, one of the first things they say is, man, I wish I'd done this a long time ago. So you might ask, what's so much better then about having God in your life than sort of living your life without God in it so much? Let me mention just a few things. Romans 5 verse 5 says that if or when you open up your heart to God, he will pour out his love into your heart. You know, if you're feeling kind of love-starved these days, there's not that much love in your life. You know, this is the real thing, the kind of love that God has. It's the kind of love that we might not consciously be aware of it, 
It's the kind of love that we all really want and need. And if you're enjoying a lot of human love in your life these days with friends and family, adding God's love to the equation only serves to enrich those relationships. Another reason why doing life with God is better than without Him is because inevitably, tough times of heartbreak and heartache and setbacks and adversity are going to come. I mean, sooner or later, there's going to be a, a serious, life-threatening health situation in your life. Maybe one of your kids is nearing the edge, and it seems like you're just helpless to stop it. Maybe there's a sudden death in your family. Maybe your marriage starts to feel like it's coming unraveled. Maybe your financial situation is just beyond hope, you feel. Maybe the person you've been dating breaks up with you. Everyone, everyone eventually goes through this kind of stuff. But when God is real in your life, you know, you don't have to face it alone. He will provide you with companionship and a new depth of strength, enough strength to get through it. Now, most of you are probably not familiar with this guy. His name is Derek Redman. And at the age of just 19, he shattered the British 400-meter record. However, in the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, Korea, he was forced to withdraw just 10 minutes before the start of the race because of an Achilles tendon injury that flared up. So he arrived in Barcelona in 1992 with his last chance to win an Olympic gold medal because sprinters can only last, you know, to a certain age, and he knew this was his last chance. And on the day of the race, Derek and his father reminisced about all it had taken to get to this point, all the practices, all the training, all of the heartbreaks, all the victories. Well, with 65,000 people looking on, Redmond gets off to a great start, and he's in the lead to win a gold medal in the Olympics. And down the back stretch, with less than half the distance to go, Redmond suddenly pulls up, lame with a right hamstring pull, and he falls to the track in pain as all the other runners pass by him. In the stands, Jim Redmond's the dad seeing his son. He runs from his place down toward the track. Now, he has no credentials to be on the track. You know, he will not be denied, though. Meanwhile, Derek Redmond has slowly lifted himself to his feet, and he starts hobbling down the track. But he isn't headed toward the infield. He's continuing the race on one leg. And after all the other runners had finished uh, across the finish line, the crowd notices Redmond and began to cheer. Later, he would say, whether people thought I was an idiot or a hero, I was going to finish my final race. Well, with just you know, 40, 50 meters remaining, Jim Redmond reaches his son. And you may be able to see on the front of his shirt, it says, have you hugged your kid today? And the father helped his son complete his final race and cross the finish line. That's kind of what I'm talking about when I say that when life gets really hard, when you have God in your life, you don't have to walk alone. He'll help you. That's why I think God, life is better with him than without God in your life. So yes, God can forgive your sins and mistakes from the past, but he can also make your present better. He'll fill your life with his love. He'll give you strength when your strength, own strength isn't enough. He can heal your wounds and, and uh, scars. He'll infuse you with a greater sense of purpose than maybe you've ever known. He'll surround you with great people who will assist you in trying to uh, uh, you know, grow uh, and develop spiritually. Okay, if the first way that Jesus' death and resurrection can impact your life has to do with your past, and the second one has to do with your present, can you guess what might be the third way that I'm going to mention? Yes, grasshopper, future. <laughs> and I'm not referring to what's going to happen to you tomorrow, or next year, or 10, or 20, or 30 years from now. I'm talking about your future, as in where you're headed when this life is over. Now, I bet that all of you here have been at a funeral or two in your life, and, and me too. I've conducted a few. And yes, I do have a suit that I wear. I only have one suit. I call it my Merriam and Barium suit. I only wear it for weddings and funerals. I have two ties, a happy tie and a somber tie. But often at funerals, you know, wishful thinking sort of takes place in those settings. And, and the underlying theme I've often noticed is, well, you know, everybody goes to heaven when they die, right? That's kind of the underlying idea. But, you know, that's not really what the Bible says. And that's not what Jesus Christ taught. 
Now, if you choose to believe that the Bible is wrong and Jesus Christ is wrong, I mean, that's your prerogative. But here's what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, not by trying to be a good person, not by trying to become more religious, not by trying to live a better life, not if at the end of your life your good deeds outnumber your bad, day, bad deeds. He said the only way to heaven is through what he did on the cross for you. Now, a recent issue of Newsweek magazine had on its cover Heaven and Hell, the Eternal Search for Meaning. And in it, they did a survey that revealed that 77% of Americans still believe there's a heaven, and 76% say they have a good or excellent chance to get there. Now, when it comes to hell, 58% believe in hell, and 6% say they have a good or excellent chance of going there. You'll probably think, who would feel that way? But when you think about it, you might have somebody in your life who would actually answer it that way. I do. But... Uh, <laughs> Maybe, you know, and maybe you're here today, somebody invited you on Easter, and you're not sure what you really believe about this stuff. Or maybe you have some beliefs, but you're not exactly sure where they came from, you know, or, or what they're based on, or how true or reliable they actually are. But the point is, we're all free to believe whatever we want. However, what we should all seek to believe is whatever the truth is about what, if anything, lies beyond the grave. Because that's the deal. Whatever it is that does actually happen after death, that's what's going to happen to you and to me. Whether I believe in heaven or not, if there's not an afterlife, I'm not going to heaven if there's not an afterlife. See, whatever it is that does actually happen after death, that's what's going to happen to you and me. So the real question is, what or who are you going to depend on for reliable information concerning the afterlife? Maybe, you know, the newest uh, psychologists, the philosophers and their, their, their books. Maybe you like what the, the, you know, a guest on Dr. Phil said. Or maybe a college professor said some things and, and you, now you believe that. Or maybe you're just going to arrive at your own view of what seems right, what makes sense to you. I think this is a really big one. And I'd hate to be wrong on this one. Because if there is an afterlife and it lasts a really long time, I don't want to wind up in the wrong place. And I'll tell you what I depend on and look to for reliable information about these matters, and it's the Bible. The Bible speaks directly and vividly about life after death. Throughout the centuries of human history, there have been countless philosophers, religious gurus, agnostics, humanists, and others who have offered up all kinds of theories and opinions as to what lies beyond the grave. But ultimately, there has only been one truth source that has stood the test of time, the Bible. No other source of information anywhere speaks with greater clarity and authority about matters of eternity than does the Bible. And Jesus himself put it this way, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live again. The Bible paints a very clear picture. Death is not the end. Jesus died, but he didn't stay in the grave, and neither will you. Maybe you heard about the guy who was out jogging one night. He's running, and it's very dark, and he decides to take a shortcut home through a cemetery. Well, there was a freshly dug grave there and, uh, for a burial the following day, and in the dark, he falls into this hole, and it's so deep, he can't climb out. He tried jumping, and, and he's crying out for help, but to no avail. So finally he says, well, I guess I'm just going to have to spend the night down here until somebody comes by in the morning. And so he lays down, he dozes off. Well, a little bit later, another jogger also took a shortcut through the cemetery. And as luck would have it, he falls into the exact same grave. And of course, he starts jumping and yelling and trying to get out. And all of a sudden, he felt a hand on his shoulder and a voice that said, it's no use. You can't get out. <laughs> but he did. He did. Jesus didn't stay in his grave, and neither will you. One day you're going to rise. But unfortunately, everybody doesn't go to heaven when they die. That's just what the Bible says. Everyone goes to a next life, but in one of two places, according to Jesus. One place Jesus describes as more full of life and beauty, happiness and love than the human mind can imagine. 
The other place he describes in terms that are equally unimaginable. It's a place of darkness, torment, and regrets. The reason Jesus Christ had to go through the torture and suffering of death on the cross was to take upon himself, the innocent, the punishment that you and I, the guilty, deserve for all of our sins and all the times you know, we took the wrong path and we did it on purpose. And many of us over and over and over and even throughout our entire lives, we've continued to do a lot of that. And the reason, that's why he died. The reason he rose from the grave on that first Easter morning was to prove that he could conquer death. And if he could conquer death, then he could give you life after death as well. So what does the future hold for you? Well, hopefully a lot of successes in life. Hopefully a lot of loving relationships, maybe some kids, maybe some nice vacations, enough money, grandkids, good health into your old age. But what after that? What's next for you? The death and resurrection of Jesus means that you're past all of the bad things, every single one of them. No matter how guilty you felt, no matter how unwilling you've been able to forgive yourself, every single one of them can be forgiven through what Jesus did on the cross. Not only that, your present can be better because of what he did. It can enhance your life. It can make your life so much better in a lot of ways. And your future, heaven for all eternity, can be yours. Not through working really hard or trying really hard, but through accepting what he has done for you. Christianity is not spelled D-O. It's spelled D-O-N-E. It's what he has already done for us on the cross. Why don't we stand? I have our closing prayer. Well, thanks for coming out today, you guys. Uh, next week, I'm continuing this series I'm doing called Building Better Relationships, and I'm doing a talk called uh, Family Secrets. And so if you can come, hopefully you come back for that. Let's pray. Lord, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity today to talk about what I believe is the most important event that ever happened in all of human history. The thing that we divide history by the coming and life of Jesus. But it was ultimately not just his teaching and miracles and the life he led, but ultimately it was that he gave his life, the innocent in place of the guilty, so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty that our sins deserve. And Lord, it's only by your great love that you would do something like that for people like us. Lord, for all of us here today who struggle with forgiving ourselves for past things or maybe forgiving other people, things they've done to us, I pray, God, today that maybe they would begin to feel a sense of healing in your acceptance and your forgiveness. Lord, I pray that we would sense your presence with us all the time, even when difficulties come, or there's loneliness or fear or failure or adversity, and God, that you would walk with us even through the valley of the shadow of death. We would never be alone in this life again. And then, Lord, we look to the future. You know, as much as we love this life and as beautiful as this world is, and it's nothing compared to what you've prepared for us in the future. But God, I pray that we'll reflect on your death, why you did it, that you raised from the dead again to prove that if you have the power to conquer death, you can raise us from the death one day too. And God, we put our hope and our trust not in trying to be a good person, but we, we put our hope and our faith uh, in you. Lord, I pray as we maybe go out and do family things today that, that you'd protect us and be with us and open our eyes to the wonderful people in our lives and the wonderful things that you've done in our lives. And we pray all that in Jesus' name today. Amen. All right, thanks for coming, you guys. We will see you next week.